It's uh, Bible study time here at Faith Christian Ministries, and uh, we're, we're in the middle of a, a, a great series that's been going for several months. We're working our way toward Galatians, <clears throat> and, and, and I never thought it would take us this long to get where we are, but the Holy Spirit ta- taught us in the beginning that you must understand the context, and if you don't understand the context, in which the Word of God was written and about the issues it's dealing with, you could very sincerely misinterpret it because you're looking through a 21st century point of view, 20th century, 18th century point of view of Western Gentiles trying to understand a Jewish book. And the the context of of even uh, understanding of the broad picture, so that every minute little point of doctrine must fit into a wider picture. And sometimes if we simply back out the context and look at the wider picture, we begin to see that which we thought we were looking at is quite different. Uh, so, to, so to that, we're going to have a great journey. I've got my tie, on, on t- this is my Torah tie, so that if you're wondering, what are these little white blotches you're seeing? That, they're Torah scrolls, because <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about the Torah. But I want to start by asking this question. Is Yahweh the creator, is he a God of order or of disorder? Now, now we've got to under, understand that. Whether, whether you believe in God or not, are we looking at a universe that's orderly? It's amazing to me that people who are evolutionists will believe that by random chance, nature became extremely, you know, orderly. There's laws at work, we're going to talk about them. And yet they look at God, if you believe in God, and say, well, we never know what he's going to do. But that's not true when we look at what God has done. What God has done is revelation of a very carefully thought out, spoken out uh, plan. In 2015, uh, NASA earlier, years earlier, had sent a spacecraft uh, out into outer space to do a flyby of the planet Pluto. And, And I'm not recalling now how many years, it was years and years and years and years before it got out there. But even our most powerful telescope uh, you know, it was simply a, a, a little blob of light in the, in, in the telescope. And, and so they planned a flyby. <clears throat> and the amazing thing to me is, think about it. I'm going to launch a satellite, break Earth orbit, send it out among the, 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 the uh, solar system. I'm going to invoke the laws of gravity as I swing by Saturn at just the right altitude that Saturn's gravity is going to take my little spacecraft and whip it like uh, ice skaters in a row would whip the guy at the end. I'm going to whip that satellite in a precise direction and it's going to intersect years later a trajectory of a planet out there, Pluto, moving in this humongous orbit that takes hundreds of years to go around and I'm going to fly by within several hundred miles of that. That makes hitting the bullseye on a target at a, at a thousand yards look simple. Absolutely amazing. And the question is, how does that happen? But what's even more amazing to me, um, that's amazing, amazing. On January 1st of this year, 2019, that that spacecraft, New Horizons, con- completed a flyby of an object out there 4.1 billion miles away from Earth in the Kuiper Belt called Ultima Thule. It's a unique object, <clears throat> and what they could pick up from Hubble, it, it just seemed to have a design that, that shouldn't be. And so they were able, after this satellite left Pluto to project, that's four years later. 2015, this object is hurtling through space on a predetermined trajectory 
And it's going to intercept now not a planet, but an object and come close enough that it can film it up close. And on January 1st of this year, that happened. The, the, the science behind it is, is, is incredible. They, had to, they actually put the satellite to sleep. So after it left Pluto, fine, turn it down, turn it off. We've got we to have a way to conserve its batteries. Four years, the thing's running in silence. Like a bear hibernating for four years, you can't imagine that. And then when they know where it should be, they send a signal that basically says, wake up. It takes hours, I don't know if it's six or eight hours, I send the signal, I don't know what's happened for another six or eight hours. And, and, And I saw the whole team, picture of the whole team film, you know, they're all there, everybody that's ever worked on this. I mean, you've worked on the project 10 years ago, but now you're all here in this room. You're now going to find out, is it still alive? Has it, has it made it in four years? Has something happened to it? Can they wake it up? And that signal comes back, and there's the, the woman who's the head of all the things. She says, we have a signal. It is alive. And the place just erupts. You know, these scientists and engineers, you know, weeping and hugging and laughing and high-fiving. A a, a feat of humanity beyond comprehension. And if you say, oh, that's nice, you don't even begin to understand. Come on. You know, go out if you're into, into skeet shooting and they send this little clay thing, object flying through the air, and you take your shotgun, track it, and shoot it. Well, you can't shoot where you see it because by the time you shoot, the bullets get, it's gone. So you got to learn how to shoot ahead of it to where you think it's going to be. And that's why they'll go bang, bang, bang and miss it. Why? Because where you think it can be isn't. That's, that's like within 50 yards or so. We're, we're talking about 4.1 billion miles away. The thing comes awake And it flies by this object and gets startling pictures that it sends back to Earth. Now, here's the question. How does that happen? It only happens because there are laws governing this universe that we have absolute confidence they do not change. Gravity is gravity, and it works in a certain way, and I can calculate because of my experience on Earth and what I've been able to demonstrate that gravity operating with mass on this planet, I can figure out how gravity with mass is working on Saturn. I can calculate precisely the acceleration that satellite... I mean, these are all laws. These are laws of of incredible certainty. There's not a variable in the universe. Absolutely amazing. And and to think that all these laws exist by chance, in my my way of thinking, is sheer hypocrisy, idolatry, uh, uh, worship of man, uh, ignorance, or as the Bible says, the man is a fool who says there's no God. Now, The only reason that is true, and the only reason we continue to do things like that, is because Yahweh is a God of order, Yahweh is a God of laws, that we can trust that the law works. Now, let me come back down to earth, and let's be a little more earthbound. This is one of my my favorites, that there is a law of gravity, it certainly worked out in space, but gravity is a law. And you can jump off the top of the Empire State Building, and if you don't have a parachute all the way down, you can believe that gravity is not working. All the way down, you can say, so far, so good. So far, so good. But gravity works, and and you are going to hit the ground. And we can tell you, because we know the laws of gravity, with exactly what force your body will hit the ground, And we can tell you uh, scientifically, as a physician, what that kind of force is going to do to your body, and you are going to end up dead. I don't care how much faith you have. Why? It's a law 
of God. But there is another law, and that's called the law of lift. The law of lift is what enables this, these hundred tons of metal to fly through the air. Take, take a, uh, just grab yourself a, a, a metal frying pan and throw it in the air and see how long it continues to go. You throw it, it goes up, it's coming down. Because it's not operating the laws of lift. But you can get in a jumbo jet and you can fly, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people and tons of, of, of cargo, let alone the weight of the plane, and it takes off and flies around the world. Why? Because listen, the law of lift always overcomes the law of gravity when properly applied. It's not a phenomena. It is a law. If it only worked in Denver, it would be a phenomena. If it only worked on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, it would be a phenomena. But the law of lift always overcomes the law of gravity when properly applied is, is so solid that we never, ever, ever, ever question when a plane crashes if somehow or other the law didn't work. Somehow the law got violated. Pilot error, mechanical error, you know, it, it's always on our part. We didn't do the law right. We never, ever, ever, ever question the law. Why? It is a law. Come on, we got to get that into our thing. Is that not right or is that not right? Come on. Now, science is simply the process of discovering the laws the Creator put in place. Uh, if you went back into uh, the 13th century, 14th century, 15th, 16th, 17th, even on into the 18th century, Every scientist was very clearly aware that they were discovering the laws of the Creator. They did not see themselves set against religion, but they were uh, in hand with religion because religion's describing God and all they're describing is how God works. You had to get into the 20th century before people began to move God out of the picture and think that somehow we didn't need a creator. Science believes the laws are there and seeks to understand just what the law is so we can then avoid breaking the laws resulting in our destruction. Now, is science perfect? Absolutely not. I grew up in a world which, unfortunately, too many people still, in both high school and college, live in, which was a world defined by a scientific premise that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Nothing. That, that, in, in my world, that was an established law. We have, we've discovered the law of God. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And, and, and it made sense to me. Einstein believed it. I mean, great minds believe that. The fact is, you and I live in a world of science today of quantum physics where they no longer believe that. Where, where they have evidence that at a, a level we don't understand yet, that atoms can communicate with themselves across the universe with no time to take to, to, for that to take place. And so now they're into exploring other dimensions that exist outside our own dimension and, and coming to this awareness that there are laws in that dimension that will always overcome the laws of our dimension. Oh man, that is good. Come on. Just like the law of lift when properly applied overcomes the law of gravity. They're both laws, but one will supersede the other. Theologians used to say back in the uh, you know early, early, early days that that if God wanted man to fly, he would have given him wings. Well, that isn't true. Obviously, God wanted man to fly. He wanted us to be able to explore the universe and everything. Uh, but we didn't know the laws, 
And so flight was of another dimension. Come on. And, and people who try to get into another dimension were considered weird. The alchemists who wanted to find the, the way to change an element into gold were always considered, you know, uh, kind of weird and in that weird world. Well, if you can turn water to wine, you can turn anything into gold. Come on. And so much of what we see in Yeshua's ministry that, that we look at and think are miracles are not miracles. A miracle, by definition, is, is something outside the law. How can God ever act outside his own laws? He doesn't act outside a law. He exercises a superior law. So you, Yeshua fully expected that Peter could walk on water. When Peter stepped out of the boat he didn't, and started to sink, Yeshua never said to him, what are you trying to do, you earthling? I'm God. You know, I can do this, but you're a man. See, you're crazy. You think you can walk on water. He said this, Peter, where's your faith? And so Yeshua understood that there is a dimension called faith that will override. It's a law, and there's a law in that dimension that will override everything you and I believe is a natural law. Come on. Glory to God. Are, are you still with me? Boy, I'd love to get off preaching on that. Maybe I'll do that Saturday. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm going to run through some uh, verses with you tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now, choose life so that you and your children may live. What is that saying? Yahweh is saying there is a law of life and there is a law of death. There is a law of blessing. There is a law of curses. And he urges us to choose life. But you can't choose what you refuse to understand. If, if I won't choose to understand how to swim, then I'm not going to swim. But there is a way to swim. But if I let fear get in my way, for example, then I can flounder around, but I'm never going to swim, even though I'm quite capable of it. There are laws for everything. There are laws for the physical world, and that's what we've been talking about in the physical universe. The satellite that flies 4.1 billion miles away, uh, the law of lift overcoming the law of gravity. There are laws by which the physical world operates, and when we understand the laws, we can rise to new heights that bless humanity. There are laws by which your body works. They're laws. Eat this and your body gets healthy. Eat this and your body's harmed. It's a law. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that ingesting too much sugar will kill you. It will make you vulnerable to diseases. Oh, but I like it, but everybody... You have all the rights in the world to eat as much of that as you want, but you can't change the law of what's happening in your body. It's a law. Come on. There are laws by which your mind works. Think positive, and you will begin to move toward the positive. Think negatively and your life will begin to move to the negative. That is a law. Well, I'm just saying things are bad, Pastor, because they're really bad. I know. I believe you they're really bad. And the more you keep saying they're really bad, the better they're going to get. Well, that's a law. It's a law of this world. And you can deny it, argue it, do whatever you want, but the studies are here. The scientists, the psychologists, the psychiatrists know by now that think negatively, you're going to have a negative life. Why? It's a law. If you can believe it, 
If you, if you can believe that you can, well, then you can. If you believe you can't, then you can't. Yeah, but I can't. As long as you keep saying I can't and have a picture that you can't, then you, you can't. And while I say that, well, I, you know, I can't jump off a mountain and fly. Don't, you know, quit being ridiculous. We're talking about where you live. You don't seriously want to jump off a mountain and fly. You have a very argumentative spirit. And that argumentative spirit will ultimately steal from you every positive word of God. You're a negative person. Your mind is negative. People do that. You'll preach a positive reason. Oh, I don't believe that. You've got a negative mind and you're going to have negative results in your life. It's a law. It's a law. And it always works. There are laws by which the emotional world works. Do this, your emotional life gets better. Do that, and your emotional life gets worse. And so you go to the psychologist or the counselor to help you get your emotional life back, but the best counsel that's going to help is going to tell you you've got to start doing things differently. Do this, and your emotional life improves. Why? These are laws. And there are laws that govern your spiritual life. Yeshua spent a lot of teaching time bringing those laws to the front. For example, your faith is the biggest driver of success in your life. Your faith. Your words are what drives faith. He taught it over and over again. Biggest thing being argued in the body of Christ is this teaching, and yet it's a law. You cannot talk negative and get positive results. You cannot talk doubt and get the results that faith will produce. You cannot. It's a law. As surely as the law of gravity and the law of lift uh, you know, are working and lift will overcome if properly applied, praying but not praying according to the laws Yeshua taught are empty prayers. And you can pray, 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 pray and not get any results. Why? You're not applying the law of faith. You're, pl you're applying religion. And religion isn't going to do it. The laws of faith will. So here's my question. All of that tonight as introduction to lead to this question. Why would a person ever assume that the laws that Yahweh taught his people have been done away with. Come on. Has the law of gravity been done away with? No. Has the law of lift been done away with? No. Has uh, the law of, of how things operate in your body done away with? No. Has uh, the laws of faith been done away with? No. Has, uh, have the laws of emotional health been done away with? No. We didn't, we didn't send out satellites and then say, well, they're not going where we thought they would go because guess what? The law's been done away with. We know that 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 the laws of the creator of this universe put into place last, they're forever, they're his laws. We have no doubt about it until we get into religion. And in the Christian religion, there's this vast move that wants to take the laws of this same God and say they're done away with. Wait a minute, that's not even logical. He didn't do away with these laws, he didn't do away with these laws, he didn't do away with these laws, but you're going to come and tell me that what he put in his word and said are eternal laws, no longer are eternal laws, then we have a creator who lied because he said they're eternal and you and your theology come up and say, laws have been done away with. Come on, see, it's not even logical, but only in religious circles can you think that. Everywhere else in your life, you believe laws work because they're laws, and Yahweh says, I have laws for life, and we say they've been done away with. See, I, I step back to get a context. We've been looking at the context of the word, the context of, of the history, the context of Yeshua. But I stepped back in preparation for this and said, how does this, the law's been done away with, we're under grace. 
step back and say, how does that fit, that little piece, in the midst of all of life we live, and it doesn't fit at all. Nowhere in life, nowhere in life, do we believe that laws cease, except in this one area of religion, taking law in grace and misunderstanding Paul in Galatians. Paul is not saying the law went away. He's saying the misapplication of the law must be going away. If you teach people the wrong way to apply the law, then you're teaching them to their own destruction. But he didn't say, throw the law out. But that's exactly what's going on in the body of Christ and has gone on for hundreds of years. So I want to spend the rest of the time that we have tonight in Psalm 119. And uh, I'm just going to skip around in different places in it. Uh, psalm 119 is the longest psalm uh, in, the, in the scriptures. And, and I'm, I'm going to be using the NIV just because that, that was what I was comfortable with at the time and my computer could get things really quick. I, I, I looked in Psalm 119 in the NIV and, and I asked this question. In that one psalm, how many times is the word law or laws used? And the word that gets translated as law or laws in Psalm 119 is the word Torah. It's the word Torah. Um, Psalm 119, by the way, is... Hundred and seventy six verses. So the word law or laws is used forty two times. The word statutes is used twenty three. The word commands or command, which by the way is a Hebrew word mitzvah, is used twenty two times. The word decrees is used twenty two times, and the word precepts is used twenty one times. So in this one psalm, the writer of the psalm, 100 times is addressing the concept of a law, a statute, a command, a decree, or a precept of the Creator. That's a lot of times referencing the law. So if I want to study the laws of God, like the physicist wants to study the, you know, the laws of, 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 of science, or, or of the universe, or the... Uh, airplane designer wants to make sure he understands all the nuances of the uh, law of lift. By the way, do you notice we're still finding new ways to understand the law of lift? And they now you see planes that have a little upturn at the end of the wing. The wing goes out and then has this little upturn. Guess where they got that from? Geese. <laughs> they watch how geese fly. We have the ability to take their flapping, put it into ultra-slow motion. We found out at a certain point there's an uplift, and they wondered at the tips of their wings. They wondered what that was about, began to study the aerodynamics of it, and found that it does something to the vortexes around the end of the wing that make it easier. Amazing. Aerodynamics right now is studied, well, actually across science, they're studying the animal kingdom to find out how to improve what we know and how science works. Isn't that amazing? So I, I just want to run through a bunch of these for you. In Psalm 119, verses 21 and 22, For I have kept the ways of Yahweh. I have not done evil by turning from my God. All His laws are before me. I have not turned away from His decrees. So if we were to say, David, what, what, is, what is your secret of success? You know, I would say a man that committed the sins that David committed and yet is known as a friend of God and redeemed his life and out of that what we would say is an illicit relationship with Bathsheba and it was, out of that immoral beginning of that relationship and it was, Yahweh was able to bring the Savior of the world out of that. You, <laughs> you, you can't get any more of an image of the redemption of God how big his forgiveness is that he takes a man 
who got sidetracked and ended up committing adultery and murder, and yet out of what the devil caused to happen, he brings the Savior. I mean, that is, that, that's a message in itself. This is the David who says, all his laws are before me. I've not turned away from his decrees. And yet preachers today would have us say, we don't need to pay attention to his laws. In verses 43 through 45, David writes this, Do not snatch the word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. David is saying, you want to be free? You really want to be free? You want to walk around as a free man, a free woman? You're, you're not bound by the opinions of others. You're not bound by negativity. You're able to resist the works of the enemy. Then you need to be seeking his laws, his precepts. This, this is the guide. What does the law say to do? But if you grow up in a church that says, no, no, you don't need, we're free from the law, then you're not going to seek the very thing that brings you success. Glory to God. Psalm 119, verses 52 through 55. I remember your ancient laws, Yahweh, and I find comfort in them. Now, now, now think about this. We say, well, the law is old. Well, they were old to David. I'm remembering your ancient laws. He's, he's doing that in a nation that has forgot his laws. But just because a nation has walked away from the laws of God, David says, I remember your ancient laws and I find comfort in them. Why? It is a law. And because it's a law of God, no matter what doesn't seem to be working, the law of God always will work. Indignation grips me because of the wicked who have forsaken your law. What does the Bible call someone who forsakes the law? Wicked. That word is twisted. It, we, we get the word wicker from it. It's, it's twisted. What, what do you think the psalmist would say today when he hears preachers say, we're not under the law. The law's been done away with. He says here that those he calls wicked. Glory to God. Wicked is defined as those who forsake the law. Your decrees are the theme of my song wherever I lodge. In the night I remember your name, Yahweh, and I will keep your law. Uh, verses 91 through 93. Your laws endure to this day, for all things serve you. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you preserved my life. Psalm 119, verses 106 through 108. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. If there are righteous laws, then there are unrighteous laws. Come on. And now you understand why Yeshua overturned the money ta uh, changers' tables and drove the men out with the whip because they had brought in unrighteous laws and therefore replace the righteous laws. Perhaps you can begin to see that maybe what Paul is dealing with in Galatia is not righteous laws. He's not throwing them out. He's throwing out unrighteous laws. But because we haven't understood it or haven't wanted to understand it, we just say Paul did away with the law. Hmm. My goodness. Except, O oh Lord, the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Key lesson. Laws need to be taught. I go down to the airport, and I, I want to charter a plane. I want a quick flight, uh, you know, up to, um, up to Bangor, and then I'm going to do something up there, and I want to come back, so I charter a flight. And, and I come to the airplane, and, 
and there sits a young man, 19 years old, and he's the pilot of my charter flight. And I say, well, good, well, great. You know, how long have you been flying? He says, well, actually, I've only been flying for three months. Oh, cool. Have you done many commercial flights, you know, charter flights? No, actually, this is my first. <coughs> I'm not getting on that plane. I'm not putting my hands, my life, in the hands of someone who hasn't been taught everything they should know. Come on, about, about flying. David is saying, you know that I, I'm a man after your heart, I'm looking for the law. But he comes to this point in verse 108 where he says, teach me your laws. Well, don't you know his laws? He knows a lot about the law of God, but he knows that he still needs to be taught. And what does he need to be taught? Not grace. He needs to be taught there's laws. The grace of God is powerful, loves you. But you, no matter how deeply God loves you, he can't heal you if you violate the law. If you won't believe in faith, you cannot be healed. In his own hometown of Nazareth, where he obviously had great compassion, he grew up with these people, and he could heal all over the Galilee. He goes to Nazareth, and it says he could not. doesn't say he didn't want to. It says he could not heal anyone there because of their unbelief. The compassion, the love of God cannot operate when you are breaking the law. Well, if God loves, he'll just heal. No, 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 there's a law you've got to put in place. And if you don't operate the law, or won't say, well, teach me the law then, then it's not God who's got the problem. The law works. If, if you fly the plane wrong, come on, if, if you don't trust your instrument, and your physical sense is saying, your plane is going right, but the instrument says your plane is actually turning to the left. And, and you decide to go with your senses, okay? And so you feel like it's going this way. And to correct that, you turn left, but you're already banking left. You're going to turn the plane upside down and crash. The law of lift works. And the law of lift killed you because you trusted your feelings rather than what can tell you what the law says. Christians are dying because they're conditioned in our culture to believe their feelings rather than to believe the Word of God. Oh, come on, folks. This is the most serious thing. We could camp out in Psalm 119 forever. All right, verse 137 and 138. Righteous are you, Yahweh, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous and fully trustworthy. The law that God laid down of lift overcoming gravity is fully trustworthy. And when you learn to operate that law, you can fly. How fast can the human body run? I, I, I don't know, but, but you know, for, for years, scientists said, sports people said, it's impossible for a human bu a being to run a mile in less than four minutes. Impossible. Impossible. Until Roger Bannister did it. And what's interesting is that after Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, within the next year, several others broke the four-minute mile. And now we're in a day and age where college students are able to break the four-minute mile. Why? It, it wasn't the law that they defined as a limit was not the limit. Glory to God. God's laws are fully trustworthy. If he says, do this and you'll live, then you'll live. And he says, do this and you'll die, you're going to die. Doesn't mean he doesn't live. It doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven after you die. It may mean that you get there earlier than you were supposed to. But it's a law of God. It's not God loved one better than the other. Somebody accepted a law of God, put it into practice, and it worked in all areas of life. In, in a marriage, in finances, in your workplace, the laws work. Glory to God. So, uh, verse 149, you still with me? 
Hear my voice in accordance with your love. By the way, that's a good verse to prove that, that back in the Old Testament, God was a God of love. That been Well, Old Testament people thought God was a God of judge, but under the New Covenant, we know him as a God of love. What do you do with this? David's writing, hear my voice in accordance with your love. He knows God is a God of love. Preserve my life, O, o God, O Yahweh, according to your laws. The only way you can preserve my life is if I'm doing what the law says. Do this and you'll live. Glory to God. In the wilderness, the snakes were there. People were being bitten and die. And Yahweh said to, to Moses, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. Anyone that will look at that in faith is going to be healed. Well, I don't understand what all that's about. I don't understand a lot about it anyway. I was obviously looking ahead to the cross of Yeshua. <laughs> But if you didn't look at it, you didn't get healed. And the word look, by the way, doesn't mean glance. It means look in faith. That's a whole other message. Glory to God. Um, Preserve my life according to your laws. Verse 151. You are near, Yahweh, and all your commands are true. Well, if the command is true, why would I ever let someone tell me the commands are no longer in effect? And so it doesn't work for me, so I get mad at God. But I'm born again, and someday I'm standing before God, and the question's going to be asked me, why did you choose to believe pastor or preacher X rather than believe my word? Well, oh, but he was a pastor. He was a theologian. He was... Wait a minute. All God's commands are true no matter what any theologian says. Verse 152. Long ago I learned from your statutes that you establish them to last forever. And the final one I want to bring to your attention is uh, verse 160. All your words. How many of them? All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Eternal. Glory to God. The law of lift will always overcome the law of gravity as long as there is gravity. If there's no gravity, then you don't need to be concerned about the law of lift. But in our finite human minds, we can't, we can't envision anything existing without gravity. You know, gravity is good. I mean, we need we count on it and rely upon it. it. It's a law of God that will last forever. The law of positive confession is going to last forever. You know, whatever you believe in is what's going to happen. That's going to last forever. It's an eternal law. Yahweh laid it down. And we want to say he's God, and then we want to say to him, ah, oh, but when he said forever, he didn't mean forever. You've you got to be schizophrenic to believe this stuff. Or you've got to be driven by a theology that never wants to bring up the people of God to be submissive to God. Because the devil knows that when he gets a group of people totally submissive to do what the Word says, they cannot be stopped. He doesn't care if you get 10,000 cheering, wildly dancing, shouting people, but their lives are in shambles. They can't put seven days happy together, and they can't live moral lives, and therefore they can't change their nation. The devil fears any group of people who will yield themselves totally to say, I am going to do what God's Word says to do, no matter what. Glory to God. All your words are true and all your righteous laws are eternal. Who gave you the right to say they're done away with? Who? Who gives reverend so-and-so? Who gives bishop so-and-so? Who, who gives theologian so-and-so the right to say that the laws of God are done away with when God said the laws are eternal? Who are you, O oh man? To stand up to the Almighty and say His word, His law has been done away with when He says my law is eternal. Glory to God. Now again, if you don't 
See, if you don't understand that and settle that, you're never going to understand Galatians. One thing I know that 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 God's laws are eternal. Therefore, when I read a verse of Paul's, it seems confusing or seems to say that the law has been done away with. I've got to throw all of Scripture away and hang on to that one verse and say that one verse, how I understand that one verse negates all of this. See, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because I already settled it. I know that God's laws are eternal. So I know it could not be. Let's continue with that thought. Paul, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, familiar, we've used them before, but let me read it to you out of the Amplified Bible. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by His inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof, and conviction of sin, for correction of error, and discipline in obedience, for training in righteousness and holy living, in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose, and action, so that the man or woman of God may be complete and, and proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. King James Bible, which many of us grew up on, uh, says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, every grace preacher I hear, and I don't hear a lot of them, but everyone I hear, I dare to believe they believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. They'll say that. Well, they do. They, they, they've done a schizophrenic split. I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. All 66 books. Well, then what do we do with it? If it's given by God, what do you do with the fact that God said His law is eternal? Well, it, yeah, but it's been done away with. You just told me you believe that Yahweh inspired David to write the verse that says the law is eternal, and now you tell me that because of the cross or because of the resurrection or because of the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant, that somehow the law of God is now done away with then you don't believe it's inspired. Come on. Glory to God. Now, if all Scripture is inspired by God, and if Psalm 119, 152 tells us that God established His laws to last forever, and if Psalm 119, 160 tells us that God's laws are eternal, and if Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them or make them full of meaning. How does anyone have the chutzpah to suggest that the law's been done away with? Could it be that we have not properly understood the law? There were men who believed that there had to be a law by which man could fly. And they didn't understand the law, so in those days a lot of pioneers died misapplying the law. I can fly the plane, the plane straight, but the, the minute I try to turn it, you know, bam, it crashes. Uh, I, I go too steep and it crashes. I go too shallow. It, you know, they didn't understand all. There was a time when they thought the the sound barrier was an unbreakable barrier. That if you flew a plane faster than the speed of sound, the plane would disintegrate. They believed that. But there were those who believed that wasn't true. And so they went out and, and pushed the limits of their understanding. What were they saying? What were they saying as they did that? Teach me your law. That's what they're saying to God. Teach me your law. I know there's got to be a law that allows us to fly faster than the speed of sound. Teach it to us. We don't know. And they pushed and sought and looked. And finally, man, they broke that sound barrier. Interestingly, they found as soon as the plane crossed the sound barrier, it was smooth flight. What scared people is they got near that sound barrier. The plane shook and rattled and fear got in. And they thought, oh, no, we're not going to make it. 
It's like people who are believing in healing or believing in prosperity, and then all of a sudden their finances are shaking or, or their body's shaking, or, and they don't know this isn't going to be. And out of their own mouth they start saying things, and the law of what you say is what you get comes into place, and so they don't break through. Meanwhile, there's some person who says, God said it, that settles it, I'm going to believe it no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no, no matter, I'm going to keep pushing, I'm going to keep believing the word, pow! They pop out on the other side and it's smooth sailing. Because it's a law. Come on. Who would have the chutzpah to challenge what God says? Could it be that we have not properly understood the law? If it was a law of God, then it is a law of God. And then the question rightly becomes, what does that law mean for us today and how do we operate it? I'm convinced this works. That doesn't mean all of it works all the time in my life. I'm learning. Teach me your law. And I do everything I, I know and I'm, I'm doing what I know and everything. And if it's not working, I come back. Teach me. There must be, I must have missed a step. There must be something I need to know. But I know I'm not going to let my mouth say it's not working because I know that law always works. What you confess is what you get. And if you say it is not working, you have lost the battle. Glory, because that's a law of God. Until we understand the law of God and that He is a God of law, there's no way you can properly understand Paul. No way. No way you can understand what's going on. Now, I've got just a few minutes left here, so I want to back up and, and, and I want to give you my opinion of what's going on in the grace versus law battle. Back in 2 Timothy 3.16. Again, in the Amplified, it's a little uh, expanded to see. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by God. It's profitable. And what is it profitable for? To instruct to instruct, to instruct, come on, to instruct. So I read about the spies in the wilderness coming back, and I read about uh, the fact that um, these were leaders. Two came back, said we can take the land. Ten said we can't, and uh, the ten were wrong. I read all that history, and it turns out the Canaanites were afraid of them. They thought they, they were the grasshoppers, but the the Canaanites thought they were powerful and, and we, the Canaanites, are the grasshoppers. What do I learn? See, I learn what not to do. If you have a promise of God and you see the promise of God, don't start saying the negative. See, I'm instructed by that. I'm instructed by that. If I'll take instruction from every word of God, Sometimes God's Word's going to tell me what to do. Sometimes God's Word's going to tell me what not to do. The book of Job will tell you what not to do. Glory to God. But because people don't receive that from it, they turn the, the, the book of Job into some kind of thing that runs contrary to the nature of God. Glory to God. So it is profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for corruption of error and discipline in obedience. That's what the people who only want grace don't want to have. Reproof and conviction of sin. So I don't want to address sin. I want to say, you know, grace covers it all. And in terms of ultimate salvation, it's, but you know what? Grace cannot cover the fruit of sin if you won't repent. And so instead of repenting, I teach you your behavior is okay. I have locked you into failure. Come on. The law says if you do this, you're going to die. Well, you do it. Is there any hope? Yes, repent. Well, instead of saying, yes, repent, I say, no, no, that God understands you. God knows what you're going through. And I never convict you of the sin of that behavior. I've locked you into the failure associated with it. 
Grace without law gives permission people to do whatever they think is right. God says, I got laws. You can't do what you think is right and be successful. Can you do it because you have free will? Yeah, but don't complain. Don't complain to your counselor. Don't complain to your preacher. Don't complain to, to Yahweh. You have no rights to complain. You're the one that's doing it. You're doing it to yourself because you won't do what the Word of God says. Very, very simple. Why? Because no one ever taught you there was a law. It's a law. Can you eat sugar? Eat all you want. Have at it. That's what you want to do. But there's a law of health that eventually that's good. You want to smoke cigarettes? Go ahead and smoke cigarettes. Just go ahead. Because you're going to do whatever you want to do anyway. I'm here to wave a flag and say it'll kill you. You know when you're 16, you take a puff on a cigarette, you don't drop dead. If you did, there'd be no smoking. But you don't. It's cumulative. It takes over. You know, you want to want to get a teenager to start thinking maybe I shouldn't smoke, take them to, to one of the VA hospitals or places like that where people have lung cancer and their lungs are eaten away or throat cancer and all because they were smokers. Uh, the voice box in there. And, and so, you know, at some point you want to wake up. This is where you're headed someday. The Bible speaks of people who say, if only I had listened. Right. Well, the truth is people don't want to listen. And so uh, the scripture is profitable to convict you of sin. Not because God wants to take away your fun. God wants you to have fun. It's no fun to do what you want for the first 20 years of your life and they be miserable the rest of your life and die miserably because you wouldn't do it God's way. Glory to God. For correction of error. If everything is grace, where is the room for correcting error? Because ultimately there is no error. And we have in the church in America, that's why the church in America, we, we, man, we have met bigger, we, well, not bigger, there's bigger mega churches in the world than in America. But we have this image of, of you know, this, this great movement of, of Christianity in America. But we do not have the commitment of the American Christian that matches Christians in Asia or in Africa. No commitment. It's a peripheral thing. It's an add-on. It's not our life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, and so the word, says Paul, is profitable for reproof and conviction, for correction of error, and discipline in obedience. How can you be obedient to something you don't receive as a law? If it's a law, you're going to obey it or not, but you're very aware. If I don't obey it, I might end up in jail. Barry Bennett was sharing the story of being in, in uh, Chile, and uh, he's driving down the road one day, and he says, all of a sudden, a policeman steps out. And he says, you could tell him his green uniform and his immaculately white gloves, and he holds up his hand to stop his car. And he said, you know, I know right away, I know the laws of physics, there's no way that man can stop my car. If I keep driving and he keeps standing there, I'm just going to run him over. Law of physics, his body, his hand, do not have enough power to affect, my, my car is going to win. He says, I could do that. But I'd be spending the rest of my life in jail. Hmm? And it's the knowledge that I'd be spending the rest of my life in jail that causes me to stop, even though it's just a hand telling me to stop. Come on. That the word of God, when it's understood as a law, then we come to it and say, that law has power and if I obey the law, then the devil has no legal right to come against me. Glory to... Be come on. It's right there. Discipline and obedience. You, you've got to be disciplined to obey the law. Our country is in deep trouble because law is being thrown out. You know, somebody can't break the law to get into the country, and then you're going to think they're going to be a law-abiding citizen once they're here. It, it doesn't work that way. Come on. But see, we're in a lawless nation. And a lawless nation has penetrated the church, so we have a lawless church. And we actually teach it today. The law's been done away with. I'm here to say the law has not been done away. God's laws are eternal. 
What we need to ask is, teach me, Abba Father, how do I apply the law? Some laws, I don't have a clue how they work today. It's a law that made sense in the desert of Mount Sinai that I don't see what that law, how it applies. But if it's a law, I can't say, well, that was just for the people in the desert. It doesn't say for the people in the desert. It's God says, this is my law. So my quest before Abba is, Abba, teach me what does that law mean in the 21st century? How do I live that law out? Not how do I just put it in a category, Old Testament, uh, doesn't apply. I, I, I'm not going to assume that. I'm going to assume that all the laws apply and, and, and ask him to teach me how do I live that law. That's only going to come to you and me as we first settle it. God's laws lead to life. And once we begin to embrace that, then we can begin to open the book of Galatians. And every time we read a verse where it seems that Paul is saying, you know, the law is bad, the law is this, he cannot be talking about the law of God, the law of righteousness. He must be talking about another law masquerading as the law of God. Well, I trust you got something out of this tonight. Uh, we'll be here uh, next Tuesday, same time, same station, same place, but further down the road as we march towards Galatians. Can you say amen? amen. Father, we thank you for uh, blessing us with your word, for teaching us. We know there's a purpose more than simply intellectualizing and understanding in our head, but there's a purpose so we can grab hold of your word at a deeper level and walk out your plan for our life till we rise up fully mature as men and women of God, serving well-pleasing to you in the name of Yeshua. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.